few will pay the price yeah. wow. to position themselves yeah. to fulfill their specific calling. Yeah. Guys, we are in lesson seven. I mean, are you getting something out of this? Yes. I'm having so, so much fun. I'm yeah. learning so much. Isn't the Holy Spirit wonderful, Chris? Yeah. Yeah, Isn't he wonderful? Yeah. All right. So now we're going to talk about in this lesson, how can a calling be aborted or severely hindered? All right. How do you abort a calling? All right. <clears throat> I'm going to read from Hebrews chapter 12, verse one. This is so amazing. Therefore, we also... Since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, mm -hmm. let us lay aside every weight and the sin, now here's the key, which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance, key word endurance, and we'll talk more about this in future lessons, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Do you see it's a race? I finished my race, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So we constantly hear Jesus say, he who endures to the end. Yeah. There is something about this Christian life. Yeah. It is not a sprint. It is an endurance run. Mm -hmm. Now, you may be able to run a sprint carrying some weights, but you are never going to run a marathon carrying a 45-pound weight. You can't do it. And that's what the apostle is talking about here. There's two things that can keep us from finishing. Number one, it's the sin which so easily yeah. ensnares us. Mm -hmm. And number two, it's the weights. And actually, the first one he lists is the weights that mm -hmm. so easily ensnare us. So since he lists those first, I'm going to talk about those first. There is an amazing encounter that Jesus has with a multitude of people in the Gospel of Luke, mm -hmm. chapter 9 and 10. Jesus has probably got a multitude around him. These are all eager, hungry people that want to be his disciples, correct? Mm -hmm. And we read in verse 57 of Luke 9. Now it happened as they journeyed on the road that someone said to him, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. This guy's passionate. I want you to notice he initiates this. He's like, Jesus, I want to be your man, right? I want to be your boy, right? I, I, I want to follow you. I want to, I, I, I want to fulfill the calling on my life. Jesus has a way of seeing through enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. He has a way of seeing through excitement or commitments that are being made without counting the cost. Yeah. Yeah, right. And Jesus speaks to security. He says, I don't have anywhere that I'm going to lay my head. I don't know, that I know of. Sometimes there are nights that I don't even know where I'm going to put my head. Now, probably, and I can see into this, this guy has got an issue with security. Huh. Yeah. He's probably got a 401k. Yeah probably got an, a Roth IRA. He's got, you know, uh, he's got <clears throat> stocks in his company. He's got his house three quarters of the way paid off. His retirement fund is set. He's been paying into the IRS and to, to, in regard to Social Security. I mean, this guy, he's been doing this for a few years, okay? And so when he hears Jesus say this, he starts kind of slipping back, Chris. And you know, what, you know what else I believe? I believe a lot of other people are slipping away that have a problem with security. All right? Same people. They heard the way Jesus just talked to this guy. They're slipping back. Then he said to another, now this is Jesus speaking, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first. Now I want you to notice the word first. He doesn't say, Lord, I will not follow you. Please Take note. Wow. He said, let me first go and bury my father. Mm -hmm. Jesus said, said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and preach the kingdom of God. Wow, that sounds a little harsh. Mm -hmm. Here's the guy burying his dad, and Jesus says something like this. You have to understand the customs of the day on this one. If you look at Deuteronomy 21, 17, you can look at later. God talks about the rights of the firstborn. The firstborn gets the double portion. Mm -hmm. But the custom was, it, it became, you know how God's word became tradition. Mm -hmm. The custom or tradition became that if the firstborn doesn't bury the father, the double portion goes to the secondborn son and the firstborn gets nothing. So you know what this guy's got in his mind? Yeah. He's got money on his mind, right? And he's slipping back. Right. Yeah. Right. 
right. And so is a lot of other people that have an unhealthy love for money. They're slipping yeah. back, right? So good. Okay. So now the crowd keeps getting smaller, isn't it, right? Mm -hmm. So now we come to the next one. And look at the next one. And another one said, Lord, I'll follow you, but let me first, again, notice the word first. He doesn't say, I'm not going to follow you. He said, Lord, I will follow you, but let me first go and bid them farewell at my house. So guys, is he passionate? Yes. yes. Is he excited? Yes. 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 Does he want to follow Jesus? Yes. 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 But he says, let me first go and bid them farewell at my house. But Jesus said to him, no one having putting his hand to the plow and looking back is fit. Wow. That means mentally fit. Doesn't mean he's not going to heaven. He's not fit for the kingdom of God. Wow. Okay. He's not spiritually, mentally fit for the kingdom. Now, what's going on with this guy? It's about relationships. Okay. He's probably got a fiance back home, his family. He's really tight with his family. And he wants to make sure they're okay with him following this fanatic. Because Jesus was seen as a fanatic, yeah. demon-possessed. He's on the cover of Inquirer magazine. I mean, come on. I mean, he, 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 he's yes. in all the gossip columns they're talking right. about him, right? He's a wine-bibber, a glutton. Yeah. And, and his family's been hearing about this, and he wanted to make sure everybody's on board with his family. Yeah. So let me first go bid them. You know, yes. this reminds me of... Um, there was a, a gentleman who I knew God had called to work for us, and he came to work for us, and he did a fabulous job. And I remember the day came when I said... Um, made the announcement we were going to move our ministry headquarters from Orlando, Florida to, uh, to, to Colorado Springs. And he was like my key guy. And um, he was brilliant. And you could see the call on his life. And he started saying, I, I, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. And, and he kept going back and forth. He'd go to meetings with me. He'd see God move and he'd go, okay, I want to go, I want to go. And then a couple weeks later, he'd go, I don't know, I don't know. And I said, hey, man, just pray about it. You just let me know. And one night I, I'm on the road and I go, to, I go to sleep and I have this vivid dream. And in this dream, he's sharing a hotel room with me. Okay, so it's a double-double, right? Now that never happens. Whenever I go minister, my assistants stay in another room. I stay in my own room because I want a place to pray. But in this dream, he was staying in the same room. And I remember... I wasn't able to get to the room because I was doing something for the meeting. I was meeting with the pastor or something. And when I came to the room, he had already packed his, all of his bags. Mm -hmm. And so I went over to my suitcase, start, started unpacking my bags, and I opened up a drawer and it was full with his stuff. I opened up another drawer, it was full with his stuff. Every drawer in the hotel room was filled with his stuff. And my bag was unpacked. And I woke up and God said, he's not going because he's putting what it's important to him first. And it was like three days later, we were on a trip, and he sat down, and he said, John, I've made the final decision. I said, I already know. You're not going. He said, yeah. Now, I love that man. He's going to heaven. He's a great man. He's a godly man. But I, I'm, I often wonder, you know, did he miss out on something that was actually maybe something that God had for him yeah. wow. because he wanted to be close to his family. Wow. He wanted to be close to the people that he grew up with, and he didn't want to leave. Wow. So it's not that this guy didn't say, I'm not going to follow you. He said, let me first. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Now that to me is so important. Right. Yeah. What are you putting first? Yeah. What's important to God or what's important to you? Yeah. That's a good question. And if you put what's important to God first, then he makes what's important to you a priority. Mm -hmm. That's what I've learned. Yeah. That's good. Huh. It's really true. Yeah. So, you know, it's like years and years ago, I realized golf was out of place in my life. And I said, you know what? I got to give this up. And I knew I had to give it up. God spoke to my heart. It was getting in the way of my relationship with him. And I walked away from it for a year and a half. And then God says, I know how much this boy likes golf. And he had two men throw thousands of dollars of equipment into my trunk within one month of each other. I said, God, what do I do with this? He said, go play golf. <laughs> <laughs> and now God has used golf to raise over probably $5 million yeah, for the awesome. kingdom. Amen. So see, I put what was important to him, and he gave me back what he exactly. knew I loved. Yeah. I believe God would have done that for that man. But he made a choice, and it's okay. It's okay. It's fine. But he made a choice. Are you seeing what I'm saying? Yeah. And so um, Jesus now deals with the three major hindrances, mm -hmm. entanglements that keep people from fulfilling their calling. Mm -hmm. What are those three? Security. Second one is money. 
third one is relationships. Let me show you what Jesus says about relationships. I'm going to show you this. This is amazing. He said, a large crowd was following Jesus. He turned around and said to them, if you want to be my disciple. So remember, here you go. If you want, you must hate everyone else by comparison. See, in other words, your love for me in relationship to your love for everyone else is going to be hate in comparison. Your father... And he, he lists it out. Your mother, your wife, your children, your brothers, your sisters. Yes, even your own life. Otherwise, you cannot be my disciple. I look at, do you know how hard it was when I first started traveling, when I said goodbye to these boys? Oh, my gosh. I, I'm sitting there, and I remember I'm driving to the airport, and I'm looking back. There's Lisa out on the sidewalk with Addison is about, you know, that big. And I, I'm just going, oh, my gosh. But I look at the relationship I have with my four sons now. I couldn't dream of a better relationship with four men. I believe God said, you put what was important to me first. Yeah. Yeah. I'm giving you back what you ever could have done. That if you, if you, so if you said, I, 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 I can't do this. I'm not going to do this. So and, and so that's what he's, he's dealing with here. Relationships. People going, I can't, do, I can't fulfill the call of God because of the relationships. I can't deal with the call of God because I don't know where the money's come from. I can't deal with the poor call of God because I've got security. I've got a house. It's almost paid for. He deals with the major thing. And you know what he's just done? He's whittled the crowd from thousands down to about 70, okay? Look at the very next verse. And this is the reason why we miss it because the very next verse happens to be chapter 10, verse 1. But you see, Luke didn't write in chapter and verse. The church in the 14th century put the chapters and verses in. This is a continuation. He continues to say, after these things, after what things? After Jesus just whittled the crowd yeah. down from yeah. thou a couple thousand yeah. down to 70, yeah. the Lord appointed. Now remember, election, chosen, and appointed are the th they're similar words. You can interchange them all through the New Testament. So I can say it like this. After the th these things, the Lord chose 70 others and sent them two by two before his face into every city and place where he himself was about to go. Then he said to them, the harvest is truly great, but the laborers are few. Why are the laborers few? Because few will pay the price yeah. wow. to position themselves yeah. to fulfill their specific calling. Yeah. Are you seeing this, guys? Yeah. Look at what Jesus says. This is a heartbreak. You ready? Jesus says, I'm going to put this up again. The harvest is truly great, but the labors are few. Look what he says in Matthew. Watch this. For many are called. How many are called? Everyone's called. Every single person is called. Remember, we established that in, in, session, in lesson one. Everyone's called, but few are chosen. Why are only few chosen? Because few will pay the price to position themselves in order to fulfill their unique, specific calling. That is a heartbreak. But it's true. So let's, let's look again. Let's look again at, at Hebrews, and it'll make sense. All right? Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Do you know what my weight was? It was security. On those three major ones, and, and, and let me tell you, there's other other entanglements that can keep us from the calling but I believe these are the three major ones mine was security and I remember I was working as an engineer at Rockwell International and there was a young man named Tony and Tony was about two years older than me and Tony was very busy in the call of God in his life he was he too was called to full-time ministry as I was and Lisa and I were trying to figure out how do we go into ministry and not have problems with security and I remember at Rockwell International, they allowed young engineers to volunteer to go to Saudi Arabia because they had a big plant in Saudi Arabia. And my wife was willing. She said, you know what? Maybe what we should do is go overseas because they paid you so much money when you went to Saudi Arabia, okay? That we thought, let's get that. Let's pay off our house so that when we go in the ministry, we won't have to receive money from the ministry. So I actually interviewed to go to Saudi Arabia. And this young man named Tony one night after a, an evening service, he said, John, is there any way I can, I can talk to you? I said, sure. And he pulled me aside and for two hours, you talk about rebuke? He just looked at me and he said, what are you doing about the call of God in your life? Yeah. You're called. The hand of God is on you wow. to preach, yeah. not to be an engineer, to preach. What are you doing? Huh. 
And for two hours, he let me have it. And I remember, I walked out of there. See, my dad raised me on how important security was. My dad wouldn't even get air conditioning in the car, wouldn't even get an FM radio because it was extra money because he wanted, he's always told me a penny saved is a penny earned. And my dad never earned more than $45,000 a year, but I believe at one point he was worth a million dollars because of how frugally he lived. I mean, amazing man. That was in me. And, 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 and so I was like, had to figure out how I was going to provide for my wife and eventually children one day, which I didn't have any children at that time at all. And security was big because my dad put that in me. But it took that young man took, look, talking to me for two hours. And I remember I came out of that meeting and I sat down with my wife after that meeting and I said, I'm going to tell my church that I'm going to take any position that opens up. I don't care what it is and I don't care how much they pay me. And I said, I'm going to do this. Are you with me? And she said, John, I'm with you. And I remember a couple months later, the pastor's wife looked at me and she said, hey, John, we have a position. It's our assistant. You'll take care of my husband's and my personal needs. This is an 8,000 member church. And she said, we can only pay you $18,000 a year. Now I'm making way more than that. And she said, I don't think we can afford you because the budget is 18000 for this position. I said, you can afford me. I'll start working whenever you want. And you know what's interesting is I was the head mechanical engineer on a multi-million dollar project for Rockwell International. I closed the whole project down. They were getting ready to put me on a whole another big project at Rockwell International. I closed the whole project down on Friday and I started working for them on Monday. You talk about God's timing being perfect. Yeah. Yeah. And that's how it all began for me. And so mine was security. Now, what about the sin that w- does so easily beset us? Mm. Let me tell you something. Sin will knock a person out of the call of God in life or greatly hinder it. I've, I've been under three pastors, and two of my pastors, well, one of them's not in ministry anymore today or, or barely in ministry. He had an 8,000-member church mm. because of sin. Another pastor had sin that he didn't deal with. And notice it says that it so easily besets us. Mine was lust. And I remember I was, I was bound to pornography at the age of 11. And I was in ministry in 1983 and still bound to pornography. And I remember realizing because, you know, what I loved is people didn't look at me and say, oh, don't worry about it. Grace covers it. You're, you're okay. Right. Yeah. God understands you got needs. Right. People looked at me and they actually said, this will stop you. Yeah. This will yeah. suck the life out of you. Yeah. This, will, this will kill your vitality right. in life. And, and I remember so going on a fast for four days, and God delivered me for pornography on May the 6th, 1985. And now later in life, that was the sin that so easily beset me. So as far as the weight, it was security. The sin was lust. Mm-hmm. And God, in his mercy, didn't let me not address that. And I look at my third pastor, our third pastor. He had a lust issue in his life that he kept under wraps. But it came out and busted it up when he was over 50,000 churches and had a church that was 16,000 members. And now he's not really, he's pastoring but a couple hundred people because he didn't address that, didn't go and get the help that he needed. So in order to finish your calling, take care of those weights and take care of the sin. You know, drinking is not a sin that easily beset me. There's no drinking in my dad's family line. I remember looking at my mom. I was a sinner. I came home one, 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 one night after, in between Christmas and New Year's, and my friends were so drunk I had to drive them all home. And, I, and my mom was waiting up for me. It was 1230, and I said, Mom, I don't even like drinking. And she laughed at me and said, You're such a bevere. And I realized there was no drinking in my dad's family line. My wife, on the other hand, was a alcoholic by the time she was 17. Her dad died of alcohol-related dementia. That was a sin that she had to really be careful of because it was one that so easily beset. For me, it was lust. It wasn't drinking. So you have to deal with these things because these things will kill you if you don't deal with them later on in life. It's better to deal with them when you're in your early 20s than have it destroy you when you're in your mid-40s. And so cast aside every weight and every sin that does so easily beset us. You know, there's 400,000 churches in the United States. 1,500 people are leaving vocational ministry every month. Wow. 
I think it's the weights and I think it's the sin. Okay? There's so much more I could say, but I, I really want to turn now towards how do we fulfill our calling? Mm. How do we literally walk through it? Yeah. From point A to point B, how do we get there on what God's given us, that dream that he's given us? That's what we're going to talk about in the next lesson. Awesome.